Last, last week, uh, we started discussing the theory of modified gravity. Uh, and I wrote the equation of modified gravity in this form. And I told you last week that we could, uh, we can show uh, that, thi that this is essentially equivalent, this theory of modified gravity is essentially equivalent to um, the Einstein equations with a massive field. So of course this T is not, uh, not the same T. Uh, but uh, but a, a scalar field corresponding to a massive, <coughs> with a massive scalar field. Okay, so so that's basically what I want to start uh, today to tell you about this reduction, how you go from modified gravity, uh, you introduce an augmented variable. And this augmented variable is very much related to the scalar curvature in space-time. Uh, and it satisfies a wave equation. And that's also what we have seen that uh, comes if you express the Einstein equation for a scalar field. You have a wave equation for the scalar field. So the structure is essentially the same. Not quite because there are constraints here on hypersurfaces uh, that are more involved compared to the one that you would get for Einstein's scalar field. But still, the general structure is the same. And, and as far as global existence is concerned, uh, the two problems are, are really equivalent. So you also remember that the system of modified gravity is fourth order because it involves two derivatives of the scalar curvature of the space-time while the Einstein equations are second order. So at first, it's, it's not clear why the two models should be equivalent, but this is something that we are going to see. And we will see that by doing a conformal transformation involving the scalar curvature of the space-time. And this is something I sketched already last time. We will next uh, introduce wave coordinates. So we choose a gauge. And we choose a gauge so we can see the hyperbolic feature of the Einstein or, or the modified gravity equations appear. Um, when you do that for the Einstein equations, you do get hyperbolic nonlinear wave equations with constraints. But if you do that with a modified gravity theory, uh, just like this, I mean, from the original space-time metric, it, it would not work. Uh, so, so you have to do two things, wave transformation and uh, this additional idea of introducing uh, an additional variable, taking the scalar curvature as an independent variable. So this is what we are going to see in a minute. And if we do all of these transformations, we go from the theory of modified gravity to uh, the Einstein uh, uh, Klein-Gordon equations. So let's, let's go. Uh, so we first need to do this conformal transformation. Right? So I remind you of uh, the definition of n alpha beta. So it was Ricci alpha beta uh, plus a contribution involving the scalar curvature and the metric. So this is pretty much like you have in the Einstein equations, except that there is this f of r or f prime of r uh, in the picture. But in addition, you have second derivatives. I mean, you have a box, the wave operator, and you have the addition of, uh, of f prime of the scalar curvature. Right? So we, we want to somehow play with that and realize by uh, doing this uh, conformal transformation that some of the difficulties in, in these expressions uh, cancel out. So, so here is a conformal metric. So g dag uh, alpha beta is defined to be e2 rho g alpha beta, where the, the conformal factor is uh, given by f prime of r. So I, I show you that already last time. There is a general formula for conformal transformation of the Ricci curvature, which is uh, written here. And, uh, and immediately, when you see it, you realize that there is a good chance of getting some cancellation and, and especially getting rid of this Asian here uh, if you properly choose rho. And the choice that I made here uh, is precisely you know, done 
so that this cancellation takes place. Right? So you have a wave operator and a Hessian, and here you have the same structure. Of course, there are some coefficients here, so it may not fit uh, exactly, and of course you have also lower order terms that will be produced here. So here you have now third derivatives of the metric. Right. Okay, so keep in mind this, uh, this structure. We do a change of variable because instead of working with capital R, we now would like to work with rho, right? So there is a natural change of variable, uh, which we will assume to be one to one. And by using this change of variable, we can express some combinations of f and its derivative as functions of rho, right? So you don't, you don't really need to, to remember that, but there are some functions, w1 of rho, w2 of rho, w of rho, which I can compute from the nonlinearity uh, of the uh, actions that we had. So, uh, so we start with this. This is the first line is the definition of the modified uh, curvature. Uh, and the second line is simply the expression of the trace. Uh, the next uh, two lines uh, are very uh, just general identities for the addition of uh, nonlinear function of rho. I mean, e to the power two rho. Just compute what it is. Compute the trace to get the wave operator, and you get the next line. And now replace in the expression of capital N. Now what we do, we simply replace R by rho. Right? So it's at this level, it's just a, a, change, of, uh, a change of variable. So uh, we are putting here now a rho instead of F prime of R, and therefore we get some lower order terms. Right. Now, uh, you use now the conformal identity for the Ricci curvature that I stated uh, a minute ago. And by doing that, you realize that you can collect so some of these terms, I mean, especially the Ricci curvature and, and, and the Asian here. So these two parts are actually uh, giving you uh, the Ricci curvature of the DAG metric. Right? So this term plus that term, this Asian give you this, plus some lower order terms which are, I have collected here, right? Okay, so just believe me that the algebra is just uh, straightforward. And the last step that I want to do, so I'm, I'm basically done. I mean, I have now understood how this N alpha beta can be expressed in terms of the Ricci curvature of this uh, DAG metric. But in fact, I like to express it by removing the trace on both sides. So that's what I, I do now. You take this N alpha beta, you compute the trace, right? So uh, so you can just check uh, term by term that uh, that sounds uh, uh, correct, and um, and so so computing the trace, you essentially remove the trace from the previous identity. We had n alpha beta, and here I took n alpha beta minus the trace, and I just see what uh, what I have. Okay, okay. So that's just a, a simple calculation, but it's it's uh, useful because it leads us to uh, the field equation of modified gravity, which are now stated in what is called the Einstein frame, in this modified uh, metric. So we have this. Now everything here is stated in terms of the metric G dag. So you have the Ricci curvature of this metric. You have uh, here uh, terms that are third order in a, in a metric. You have uh, now a metric term plus a function of rho, and the rest is, uh, is a matter content. So you have the matter uh, tensor here, and remember that we have removed the trace. So this is the same as that, because we have used the modified gravity equation that tells us that n uh, is equal to 8 pi t alpha beta. Okay. Okay, so this transformation has a good advantage is that it removes first order derivatives of our unknown metric, but now we need to work with a different metric. So remember the story about Einstein frame and um, you know, Jordan, Jordan frame. Uh, so, so I said before that we had to stay the matter coupling in the Jordan frame. So the Georgian frame is important for that purpose. But in the same time, for, to do the analysis of the problem, we have to work in this Einstein frame. Right? So both have some interest. Now we continue with the Euler equation. So I, I guess what I show so far uh, until, until here, this is what we were doing last time. Right? Now let's continue uh, the discussion with the Euler equations.
So we do the same, right? I am in the similar procedure. I, I'm writing here a general conformal formula for the Christopher symbols of the DAG metric. So it's equal to the Christopher symbol of the original metric plus uh, terms that involve uh, one derivative of rho of the conformal factor. And from that, I compute the divergence of n alpha beta, but now with respect, I'm now using the DAG uh, metric, right? So you can uh, expand it like this by lowering uh, the index alpha that becomes a gamma here. Uh, and you can write the definition of, uh, of the covariant uh, derivative. You get these terms. And here you have the gamma DAG, which you can replace by using the line before. Right? So it's just uh, uh, elementary uh, calculation. And in the next, next line, I have simply collected terms that involve, instead of gamma DAG, I just want to keep the term that contains gamma. So I put gamma DAG is gamma plus a uh, remainder, a remainder in some sense. And I do the same for this gamma DAG here that becomes a gamma uh, plus some additional terms. So, uh, so this is what you get. You, uh, you recognize, of course, the covariant derivative of n alpha beta, or the divergence of n alpha beta for the first part. And you have, again, to collect some uh, lower order terms. Right? But the, the main point is that I have now connected divergence of n alpha beta and this divergence of n alpha beta. Of course, uh, we already have proven last time that the divergence of n alpha beta was 0. This was a consequence of the Bianchi identities. Uh, and it was uh, some additional, I mean, calculation compared to what you have to do for, for the Einstein tensor. So to prove that was already remarkable to tell us that was telling us something about the structure of n alpha beta. So this term vanishes, and therefore you end up with what you, you wanted. You get that the divergence dag of n alpha beta uh, is equal to such terms. So of course, on this side, there is no derivative of n. You have only derivative, one derivative of rho. Uh, it has this form, so that comes just by collecting the terms that you had here. And now if you use uh, gravity equations n equals 8 pi capital T, you can replace n by T, and that's just what I, what I did here. So, uh, so you should observe that the divergence equations that we had for uh, T alpha beta in the original frame, this divergence law, uh, is now transformed into something which is not quite uh, divergence law. Right? You have lower order terms here that needs to be uh, taken into account. And some of the confusion and the debate in physics actually comes from this identity, that you don't have zero on this side because of this change of uh, frame. OK, now you remember that the, the next step is to introduce the wave coordinates. right? So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to show you the Ricci curvature in general coordinates. Right? So just something very uh, fundamental that we will need here. Uh, so I introduce the Christopher symbols. And especially what, what I introduce actually is a sum, I mean a summation of uh, gamma dag uh, alpha beta lambda. So I sum uh, over alpha beta. Uh, by using the metric, and I, I define this to be gamma dag lambda upstairs and gamma dag lambda downstairs uh, if, I, if I do it uh, this way. Uh, and the motivation to look at such quantities, so now I will show a couple of identities and maybe <coughs> the logic will appear uh, only at the end of this page or in the next page. But let's say that I, I want to work with these uh, uh, Christoffel's coefficients with only one index. Uh, one motivation why I am going to do that is that if you express the wave operator, uh, you, in fact, you, normally you get two terms, right? So the wave operator, the geometric wave operator applied to some function u, box g dag of u, is given by two terms. So you have second order derivatives and you have also uh, first order derivatives involving the Christopher symbol. So this is just the definition, right? And, um, and therefore, uh, and, and now I'm going to define this quantity here. I will call it the reduced wave operator. Okay. And it's indeed, uh, it's coincide with the wave operator precisely 
uh, if, and, if and only if this gamma with only one index are vanishing. Right? So for some reason, it's convenient to work with this uh, simplified wave operator. And, uh, and the wave condition that we are going to impose uh, are exactly that these gamma are equal to zero. And you, you can see that easily, because what we are going to do for, for the wave condition, for the wave gauge, is to assume that box in the metric, so our metric is G dag of x alpha is equal to zero. Okay, so this is alpha, we have four coordinates in the space time. So each of them should be a solution of the wave equation. And this is exactly equivalent to say that our uh, gamma alpha uh, dag are vanishing for alpha equals zero, one, uh, yeah, I guess one, two, three would be better. Okay? Um, so, so you, I mean, you already know that uh, you, you can see with this that uh, gamma lambda vanishing is our wave condition. Okay, but before we actually see that, there's a few calculations that we need to do. So we first express the Ricci curvature uh, in, a general, in general coordinates. So we start from the expression of the Ricci curvature uh, as first order derivatives of the Christoffel symbols plus quadratic terms. The Christoffel symbols themselves are given by first order derivatives of the metric. So these are just the basic uh, formula of differential geometry. And you compute this quantity. So you compute d lambda gamma minus d alpha gamma with some, some choices of uh, indices. And if you compute that from, uh, from, from this line, uh, of course, you, you get uh, long, long term, but, uh, but I more or less spell out uh, some of the details of, uh, of this calculation. So it's, it's basically straight, I mean, it is straightforward. Um, uh, okay, just it takes time to uh, have all the indices uh, fixed uh, correctly, but I, I think it should be correct on, uh, on this uh, screen. Uh, and so so if, you, uh, if you do this uh, calculation, uh, this is what you get. Okay, so you get that this quantity here, which is of course nothing but the first term that came in the definition of the Ricci curvature. So this is what I'm computing. This term is a main part of the Ricci curvature. So this is what I get. I get that this is minus one half g lambda delta d lambda d delta of the metric. Okay, and remember this definition. So this is really minus one half box tilde of, uh, of this component of the metric. So that's what I want. I mean, if you want to say that Ricci equals zero or Ricci equals some uh, matter terms, uh, you, you, you need to look at uh, you know highest derivatives in the Ricci curvature, and it is this term. Okay, not actually not quite, but this is what we will get in a in a minute. But it's not quite uh, only this term, because you can see that in the next line you have additional terms also involving two derivatives of the metric, right? So it doesn't look very nice at this stage uh, because, because this, this is a wave operator, but, but this is not. I mean, if you look at the indices, the indices are just uh, mixing uh, um, the components and, and the derivatives in a, in a not very you know, useful way. So, okay. so you, you want to get rid of these in, a, in some sense, and that's what we will uh, do now. Okay, so before we uh, can do that, we proceed by computing this quantity. Okay? So somehow forget about the last uh, uh, identity and look now at this. So you look at the Christopher symbols with one index and compute d alpha. Ooh. We are basically at, uh, at this stage, right? So I, I was telling you that we should compute now uh, d alpha gamma beta plus d beta gamma alpha. And that's what you can see, uh, you can see here. Right? So you want to compute that you return to the definition of the gamma, and you do that. I guess it's, it's really impossible to, uh, for you and even for me to explain uh, what's going on, but this is straightforward calculation you know, from the definition. And the point is that you have to understand what we compute, right? And why we are computing this or that, OK? So, uh, so gamma beta with one index, you, you understand what it is, right? Just summation, you get rid of two indices in the Christopher symbols, OK? Then, Let's compute this quantity. You know, maybe you don't know why yet, but you will see in a second, right? So compute this quantity, return to the definition, and just 
plug uh, it in a, in a D alpha, so compute D alpha of gamma beta, and realize that some, there is some constellation and sum up uh, two things. So you make it symmetric. Uh, so you make this symmetric by uh, switching alpha beta uh, in this way. Okay. And, and this is what you get. So, so the point, so le let me give you the point of, uh, at the end of this, uh, of this calculation. The point is that this quantity, which we have computed for maybe no reason, now what we realize is that this quantity has exactly the form that we have found a second ago. So a minute ago, if I return just, uh, um, just here. So we computed the main part of the Ricci curvature. We found a modified wave operator. And we find a lot of uh, terms that we didn't like, three main terms that we didn't like. Right? And now what I'm telling you is that these terms that uh, we didn't like uh, much, so one, two, three terms, they actually have a structure. They have a symmetric part of the derivative of this Christopher symbol with one index. OK? So, so this is the first uh, observation. And I don't care about terms that involve one derivative of the metric, products of one derivative of the metric. At least I don't care about that uh, yet. But when we want to prove the global stability of Minkowski space, of course, it's going to be very important to have an information about the structure of that. And, and you will see that this, uh, these terms have some structure, which is quite uh, interesting. So, uh, so here we are now. Um, we are going to subtract the terms that we didn't like in the expression of the Ricci curvature uh, to the principal part of our system. So that's what I, I'm going to do here. Uh, so I take n alpha beta minus the trace equal t alpha beta minus the trace. That's our field equations that we would like to solve. And what I do is that I, I assume I have a frame or I have coordinates that allows me to compute the Christopher symbols and therefore to compute the Christopher symbols uh, uh, contracted two indices with two indices contracted. So I assume that I'm in this uh, situation. And I, I look at this quantity, and I take this quantity, and I subtract it from the field equation. So in other words, what I'm doing here, I'm actually introducing a different problem, maybe not the one, the one we want to solve, right? But I modify the field equation in this way. Okay? And, and of course, because I, I have added or subtracted uh, with the right uh, sign here, uh, this coefficient, of course, the problem that we had in the expression of the Ricci curvature is gone because I have just added or subtracted the terms that I didn't like, these three terms that didn't give you uh, the modified wave operator. And so the only thing which is left as a principal part of our field equation is indeed uh, this delta um, uh, tilde, uh, this box tilde operator given by that. And now standard local existence theorem will apply. So it seems that we are done. But of course, we have not solved what we wanted, right? So, uh, so now we have this key observation, propagation property. It says that if you now assume, so you have solved this problem, and now you assume that this gamma lambda are vanishing initially on a Cauchy hypersurface. Okay. So you, you choose your coordinates in such a way that this quantity is vanishing. And in addition, you also uh, assume that the Hamiltonian momentum constraints are satisfied. Okay. So uh, then you can prove that the gamma lambda are vanishing everywhere in the space time. So you have propagated a condition that you impose on the initial hypersurface. This condition can be propagated to the whole space time. And therefore, if you now you uh, look at what you have, uh, you have done, you have uh, actually uh, now you have been able to, to actually solve the right problem because, because the terms that you have added here, and, and you had to add them because otherwise you would not get a definite type for your PDE, right? So you could not apply any local existence theorem. But if you have done this modification, you get a, a, some type of the PDE, which is a hyperbolic wave uh, system, system of wave equations, of couple wave equations, and therefore you can apply local existence uh, results. 
uh, and, but now everything goes well because if the gamma are vanishing initially, they are vanishing for all time. So, so, so in fact, in the end, you realize that the terms that you have added are identically zero. And they, they, you have indeed solved the equation that you wanted to solve. OK. So, uh, so this, is, this is a conclusion here. We can impose a wave gauge gamma lambda equals zero uh, according to this uh, discussion here. And if now we return, I mean, this is really a general fact that uh, could work also with the, the classical Einstein equation. You could, of course, put a g alpha beta here instead of n alpha beta. The story uh, would be ex exactly the same. Okay. So now for us, for the modified gravity equations in the wave gauge, this is what we have obtained. Right? So we have killed, by imposing this wave condition here, we have killed uh, in the Ricci, in the expression of the Ricci curvature, we have killed second order terms, second order derivatives of the metric that had no specific type. So they are gone, and we have only left with a modified wave operator of the metric components. We have quadratic terms that, uh, for, for the moment, I didn't try to compute. We have, of course, some additional terms, I mean the matter, which is, which is this. And we have two more terms here involving one derivative of rho and involving a function of rho. Okay? And so, so this is really something that you, that you see uh, immediately from the expression of the Ricci curvature that we, we have here uh, and from the expression of um, uh, here, up, uh, here of, uh, sorry, uh, before, uh, we had this expression here for the field equation of modified gravity. So I, I'm just taking this. I collect that as somehow low, <coughs> lower order terms. I mean, uh, not so, uh, they are not that negligible, but you have this term that you keep, and this one you replace by box of the components. Okay, uh, now. Now, uh, of course, the matter should all be, I mean, this should be supplemented with an equation for the matter. Okay. So you also remember that we have proven that the <coughs> divergence of T alpha beta is not zero, but it contains lower order terms, one derivative of rho con containing this, and I, I wrote it here. Uh, and if, if you want to have a whole description, you have to recall that the gamma with one index are vanishing. And you have also to remember that there is a relation between rho, uh, this coefficient rho, and the scalar curvature of the spacetime. Okay. So that's pretty much uh, the complete uh, system, at least the evolution part of the equation of modified gravity uh, in wave gauge. But, uh, but these equations are not uh, useful yet because uh, they they still are quite involved because they still involve here three derivatives of the metric, right? And some nonlinear function, rho is a nonlinear function of two derivatives of the metric, and then you again uh, compute one derivative, you make this product. So, so it's really just impossible to study the, the system in this form. So before we proceed, I have one more um, point to make, is that there is a trace equation here, box tilde of rho, uh, which you can also obtain as part of the previous calculation. Okay. So in, in, the, in the rest of the discussion, I will actually, I'm going to use this equation here, uh, but I, I didn't add it here because, I mean, at, at this moment, the way that we see it, we don't really need to, 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 to introduce this equation, but in a second, this equation for the trace uh, will be very important. Okay. So, uh, so now we continue. So now we are going to introduce an augmented variable. So we will now define a, a bigger system. So the announce will not only be the metric and the matter fields, but they now will be uh, the metric, the matter fields, and this uh, function rule. Okay. So, uh, so the augmented uh, formulation. So this relation E2 rho is F prime of R will no longer be imposed. Okay. And it's just, uh, as I said, it's a rather complicated uh, connection between, uh, uh, you know, it's rather nonlinear function. So, so you would like to get rid of it in, a, in some way. So we don't impose that anymore. And to emphasize this fact, I'm going to replace this row by a different row notation like this. And it's now 
an independent variable. So, um, so we, you know, we are proceeding with this uh, uh, reduction here. We started with a metric uh, which we have replaced by the DAG metric by conformal transformation. And in addition, on top of that, we have some, uh, some fields. So if T alpha beta is given by a scalar field, for instance, we have a scalar field uh, in addition uh, to, to solve for. Now, in the new formulation that I'm going to write in a, in a few minutes, we will have this uh, conformal metric as a main noun. Uh, we will also have the scalar field phi for the matter. But now we have a new variable rho, uh, which I defined uh, in, in this way. So I, I start with the idea that E2 rho is equal to F prime of R, but now I, I just forget about this relation and I, I introduce a new independent variable, which I still call rho. This algebraic constraint, you can see it as an algebraic constraint. If rho is, uh, is a new noun and r is a scalar curvature of the spacetime, this is a, an algebraic constraint between the various quantities. I'm going to replace this by a trace equation that I show you, box of rho tilde, etc. And I'm also going to use a new notation for, for the metric here in order to, uh, so maybe, a, maybe something like that. So I'm introducing a new variable Rho, rho, you know, with a, maybe a different rho like this, and I'm also introducing a new metric. So this, at this level, I will say that I have an augmented uh, model system, right? So here we had the original system, and and here in the middle we have the conformal, the conformal version of uh, of this problem. So, uh, so keep this in mind. We have two main nouns, rho, this new rho, and the metric G DAG with two, two DAGs here. Uh, and we proceed with us by uh, introducing now the tensor field of modified gravity by this relation. So what I'm writing here, you remember that N alpha beta was Ricci, DAG, and some uh, products of one derivative of rho. So I'm, I'm taking, this is exactly the definition that we had before, maybe with a, <coughs> some change that uh, trace is taken on, on this side, um, rather than putting it on the other side, but that's just a matter of convenience so in, a, in a notation. So this is really, you can read this by saying that N alpha beta is equal to Ricci plus uh, one derivative and uh, zero derivative of rho. So we had that before, but the only thing which is new now is that instead of the rows that we had before connected to the scalar curvature, I'm now taking a row which is an independent variable. Okay? So somehow it's a different object. It looks completely the same. I just put an additional DAG and I change the shape of the row, but it has a different meaning because, because now row and uh, G DAG DAG are no longer connected at this stage. Okay? And, uh, and now I want to uh, postulate a system here. So remember what we want to get, right? So we want to get a system which is really Einstein uh, plus a massive scalar field. So this rho is going to satisfy uh, the massive uh, uh, scalar field e equation. And that's what we already see here. Uh, so I, I, I keep the equation between n alpha beta and t alpha beta that we had before, but now I'm writing it with a g dag dag metric. And I add the equation that we derived before for rho, but now I'm writing it for the new rho variable, independent variable, and I'm expressing it in, a, in this new metric g dag dag. Otherwise, it's the same equation as before. Okay? So I can define this. I mean, this is like a, a new model, if you, if you wish. Right? I had uh, n alpha beta e equal t alpha beta, so this was some rather uh, complicated uh, uh, equation, I, uh, and I, I'm, I'm somehow um, uh, disconnecting the relation between rho and the scalar curvature of the metric, right? So you forget about this. Now, of course, whether it's reasonable or not, this is something we will see in a, in a second, right? So the first statement that I want to make is that if now we take this as our model, 
we still have the imp important observation that uh, the divergence of T alpha beta, or the same, the divergence of N alpha beta, dag dag, is still equal to exactly the same stuff that we had before. Okay? So the Euler equations will follow from our extended, our augmented model of modified gravity, right? which is not, uh, it's not clear a priori, because I, I'm, I forget now the relation between rho and capital R. But you do that, you define an augmented system, but yet you can still derive the Euler equations. So the proof is given in the a, in a next page. Uh, I guess I should be a bit careful about, uh, about time, so I may skip uh, uh, the proof of that, but it's just a one or two page uh, calculation. And it does not require the relation between rho and f prime of r. Now, uh, okay, so now like we had for the wave gauge where we introduced some gamma with one index and in the same way it, you, you could see some connection between the two procedures that uh, to handle the wave gauge I had to also to modify my system, you know, solve the system with this gamma, uh, big gamma added. And then I realized that uh, if they vanish initially, they vanish for all time. So this was a propagation property. So same, same is true here. There is this propagation property that we expect. Uh, if you consider the equation satisfied by Borg's g dag dag of rho, which is this uh, additional variable, and f prime of r of g. But what is g here? So g is connected to g dag dag. I guess there is uh, one dag missing here. Uh, so if you compute this equation, maybe not surprisingly, I mean the structure, of course, this is done uh, for, for that, but, but still. Uh, so you compute the box of that, and you realize that you can deduce from these uh, properties that you expect. So if initially uh, the, 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 the new field, the rho, coincide with the scalar curvature of the space-time, initially on some initial slice, uh, on, a, on a Cauchy hypersurface, and the wave gauge together with the Hamiltonian and momentum constraints are satisfied, then this condition will be satisfied everywhere in the space-time. Okay? So you, you can do that. You can forget about the connection and only recover it from uh, the assumption that it is satisfied on, on hypersurface. So you can see it as a constraint which is propagated by your equations. So what I, I can conclude here is that we have truly extended the system of modified gravity. You know, well, we have bigger system, and the system that we want is, is part of this bigger system. So if we solve the bigger system, which uh, the interest is that the system has a nicer structure, uh, then we will be done. Okay, I will, uh, le let me skip uh, this calculation. I think it will not bring, uh, so there are two pages, let me just say briefly that you want to show, you want to compute the divergence of T alpha beta to derive the Euler equations at the point I made. So, uh, of course, this is equivalent to compute the divergence of N alpha beta. Uh, and, and this is the equation that we would like to prove. And to prove that, you use the definition of N alpha beta. Uh, you remember that, uh, uh, you know, you somehow extract the Einstein part uh, out of it, you know that the Einstein part uh, is divergent free, uh, so you only need to take care of the, the other terms, but the other terms satisfy some trivial identity, so you just compute that uh, step by step by uh, being careful about, uh, about these, uh, these derivatives, and, and you, you get the divergence, you simplify this a little bit by using the wave equation on, on the rho, uh, and, uh, and, and you get the statement. So the point again is that the Euler equation for this augmented model is exactly the same that we had for the original model. So true extension of uh, the system of modified gravity. Okay, um, so we uh, can now summarize uh, the formulation for general matter models uh, is given here. Right, so I'm just writing this uh, uh, one more time, but it's, it's essentially a summary of uh, what we have seen. So the DAG-DAG metric for, for this augmented system uh, satisfied a system, a couple system of uh, wave equations with quadratic terms, 
products of, of rho and this. And this is coupled with also a wave equation for rho, lower order terms and the matter contribution. Right? So that's uh, what we have just uh, uh, obtained. Uh, and we have also the Euler equation for, for the matter. Okay. So we have done, you remember that there was the assumption that we were doing the Jordan coupling. We have used wave coordinates in order to simplify the Ricci curvature uh, and, and the wave operator for rho. Uh, and, and that's what, uh, what we have here. So let me uh, emphasize uh, again this fact that if you compute, so, so you can somehow simplify, you can factor out the uh, power of rho here. So you take, uh, yeah, you take this equation here for T alpha beta and uh, if you put a weight rho minus 2 here, it will somehow uh, arrange itself a little bit. But yet, uh, this is what you can see, a stress energy tensor which is conserved in the Jordan frame uh, is not conserved in the Einstein frame and vice versa. So if you want to change the point of view, of course you could uh, impose <coughs> this as a conservation law uh, in the Einstein frame, but then it would not be conserved in the Jordan frame. So at this level, this is a choice of a physicist that uh, I, I, I don't have to discuss here. Um, and, and it will only be for special matter models that uh, this would be vanishing. Okay, so now we, we are essentially at the end of this, uh, of this chapter. Let me uh, re-summarize the structure of the system. Uh, emphasize that this is in the physics, this is sometimes called massive scaleron. So, so what I have done in this last, uh, almost last uh, slide of this chapter is that I have renamed uh, the function W of rho that, that we had. So in a previous slide, I had, uh, maybe I, I just call it W, W1, so whatever this is, it doesn't really matter. But now what I will do, I will look at, uh, say, the behavior uh, of that. So now I, I return to, to the expression of F, and I remember that the F was actually, uh, so the way that we defined uh, this function f of, uh, of r, uh, at this level, of course, no choice has been made. But, but you remember that we have in mind that f of r should be r plus some constant kappa uh, r squared, plus maybe higher order terms, right? So we are thinking of making a correction to, uh, uh, to the Einstein model. And so if you keep this in mind, you, you look at the expression for uh, these functions w, w1, w2. So you compute that. This is what you get. I mean, you get, uh, it's a simple remark that if you, if you look at that, you can actually separate uh, this weight, this uh, term, into two parts. There's one part, which is minus rho over 3 kappa. I guess this kappa is, I think, the same as that. Maybe I had a kappa over 2. It really doesn't matter. But, um, but this kappa here comes in, in this uh, uh, Klein-Gordon equation here. So this is Klein-Gordon, right? Wave equation plus a term with a good sign. And this W of rho and V of rho are quadratic order when rho goes to zero, right? So uh, they are high order. For the global stability theory, uh, they, they will not really give us a, a problem. And we will concentrate, so later on what we will do, we'll concentrate on this Klein-Gordon structure, uh, this wave equation structure, and we will look very carefully at, uh, at uh, these terms and, and of course at the nonlinearities that describe the interaction between the metric components. Okay, so, uh, so and, and we will also use uh, the gauge condition, we will also use the constraint between the scalar curvature of the space-time and the function rho, right? Which you, you remember that this is something that we can uh, assume everywhere, point-wise, because we have proven that if we impose that initially, it's propagated. And in the same way, if we impose this condition initially, uh, it is propagated. So this is something that we can impose everywhere. And uh, the Hamiltonian momentum constraints should also be added to that. Right. But in, in some sense, this, is, this will not play a role uh, in, uh, in uh, the analysis of the global existence. What will play an important role are, are these conditions here, because these conditions will tell us something about 
the structure of the nonlinearities in, in the system. Okay. So, conclusion. So, we have obtained this nonlinear wave Klein Gordon structure that we expected. Uh, and, and the conclusions that I wrote on the blackboard uh, have been reached by, by this. And let me remind you what I say in the beginning that this theory of modified gravity is only one member of a class of models. Uh, the bronze decker theory uh, or the scalar tensor series are also interesting and they have basically the same structure uh, Klein Gordon, Einstein Klein Gordon. Uh, what we will see in, in, uh, in the end uh, of the lectures will be the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space time. Uh, which is definitely very different uh, uh, compared to the massless uh, problem because the Klein Gordon potential does modify the global dynamics very uh, dramatically. Uh, so we will need to study that. And, and in fact, there are uh, um, in physics or, or in uh, num numerical work, uh, people have argued that if you add a massive field, to uh, on top of the, of the flat uh, uh, Minkowski metric, uh, this massive field could, could create some instabilities. Right? So it was really not clear at the beginning of this project uh, whether these uh, massive uh, modes could uh, make uh, Minkowski space unstable or, or, or not. Uh, but in, in fact, the point is, is that the theorem that we prove here uh, assume that the matter, the massive field, has sufficiently small mass. So the effect that was observed numerically is an effect that only is observed beyond some threshold, where the mass of, uh, of this field is sufficiently large. So, uh, so we'll return to this and, and show that the perturbation come from a, a massive scalar field disperse in a uh, time-like direction. And, and the space-time, in, in a certain sense, reconverged to Minkowski space. All the mass has dispersed. Uh, and in particular, the space-time that you construct uh, by this is complete, time-like geodesically complete. Okay, so we will return to that later on, to look at the time decay and, the, and this technique of hyperboloidal uh, foliations. Okay, I put some references uh, here that you, if you want more details, you can, you can look at. So these are the uh, classical references uh, some, some years ago uh, to prove uh, stability of Minkowski space uh, in a vacuum or massless uh, case. So Christo de luc this was the first uh, work in this direction. And after that, Lindblad Ronjanski proposed uh, a different proof, and the proof I, I did is uh, with uh, Yuma, and, and I will show this later on. And this is a numerical work that I was uh, telling you about. So if you look at this title, Collapse of Self-Interacting Fields in Asymptotically Flat Space-Time, do self-interactions render Minkowski space-time unstable? Okay. And the answer, numerically, is the answer no if, uh, if the mass is sufficiently small. But if the mass is large, it, it, I mean, other features can, can happen. So before we make a break, so we, we, are, we are done with this uh, uh, story, but before we make the break, uh, I would like to start the discussion of, uh, of space-time with symmetry. So this is the next topic that's, that we will be uh, discussing. Um, and as I said several times in, uh, in the first chapter, we will actually revisit a number of definitions. Right? So of course, it's good if you have understood the chapter one, part of it, uh, but definitely you don't need to master all the details and all the formula of the first chapter to start with the second chapter. So this is what we will do. So we would like to define uh, a class of space-times where the metric has a very low regularity. So it's so low that you cannot define the curvature of the space-time. At least you cannot define it in a classical sense. You, you have to use distribution theory to define the curvature. Um, so this chapter uh, look at, at the definition. So even defining, defining the space-time is, uh, is already some work uh, and expressing uh, the Einstein equations in coordinates. That's what we will do in this chapter. Definition and uh, formulation in coordinates. 
the class of spacetimes we will cover here is a class of Ricci flat Lorentzian manifolds with T2 symmetry. So T2 symmetry uh, involves this assumption of invariance <coughs> under the action of uh, the Lie group T2. So there are two killing fields in the spacetime that will uh, simplify the analysis that we want to do. Uh, in terms of topology, the topology of the slices will be T3. Right? So you have to, to think of, well, there will be a foliation in a, in a minute uh, of our spacetime, so, so you have a spacetime and the, the topology is an interval cross T3 and each slice of, uh, of that is, uh, so slices are space-like and they, they will cover the space-time that we, we want, okay? And now on each slice, you will have two killing fields that are space-like and, and give you some, in, in, so therefore, some invariance on, on the metric. Um, okay, so why looking at this setup? So this setup seems to be appropriate if you want to understand the propagation of gravitational waves. Okay. And there is this idea that uh, gravitational waves uh, can be quite singular and can be impulsive, uh, meaning that uh, the curvature is going to be really a distribution. I mean, not only discontinuous, but, but the curvature will, will contain uh, real s genuine singularities and, and th they will correspond to so-called impulsive gravitational waves propagating in the space-time. So you could not have this uh, situation uh, if you would assume spherical symmetry. So that's another assumption that I will discuss later on, but I will discuss that uh, coupled with a uh, with matter. And the matter will contain propagating modes. Right? So that would make sense, spherically symmetric uh, and the matter. But here, if I want to look at Ricci flat manifolds, uh, the natural class where you, you see some interesting phenomena uh, is, uh, is a class of T2 symmetry. So that's what we do. And what we w are planning to do now is to, uh, to define the notion of Cauchy developments of initial data sets. So the so class uh, will be weakly regular. I, I need to define what it is, and that's going to take some time. Uh, and we will uh, we'll be uh, able to solve the Cauchy problem in this class, but this will, not, this will be done actually in the next chapter, so it's going to take a bit of time uh, to, to lay out uh, all the st structure, all the ideas. But, uh, but eventually we will solve the Cauchy problem. First we will do this locally, construct somehow a piece of space-time with this weak regularity, and then we will be able to analyze the global causal structure of these space-times, so geodesics, late time asymptotic. So there are a number of interesting things that, that uh, can, can be done. So the outline for this chapter is, is that first we will have a couple of sections uh, about geometric definitions. So what do we mean by a weakly regular manifolds? Um, that would be the first, uh, first question. Uh, and having the definition of what manifold we are talking about, there will still be some work to, uh, to write the Einstein equations in a, in a weak sense. Okay. So there are really you know, two, I mean, two questions here. What is a class of uh, space-time that you want to work with? And if you, if you take this class, how do you actually express the Einstein e equations in a weak sense? And after doing that, we will introduce coordinates, so I, I will write, uh, call them admissible coordinates in a rather natural sense. Uh, so they will be more or less general coordinates that we will introduce here. And in the next chapter, we will make specific choices and we will look for foliations of our space times uh, based on you know, some, uh, some time function that will be suitably chosen. Okay, we uh, need a couple of pages about some background material. And I think the first thing I want to do is remind you uh, of the standard formulation. So for regular data, but of course this is something that uh, now you know. Uh, the initial, an initial data set is a Riemannian 3 manifold, a symmetric two tensor field. So sigma h and k for the second fundamental form. 
they cannot be chosen arbitrarily, but they have to satisfy some constraints. So that's what we have seen. And a globally hyperbolic Cauchy development is a 3 plus 1 Lorentzian manifold, satisfying the Ricci flat condition. And such that there is an embedding of sigma in M. Uh, sigma phi of sigma is a Cauchy surface in our space time. And, uh, and the pullback of the first and second fund fundamental form of this hypersurface should coincide with our data, H and K. That's what I, I stated uh, last, uh, last week or already. Of course, for us, uh, the data will not be regular. So essentially, no, no, none of this line makes sense, will make sense for us. Right? So we need to revisit absolutely uh, everything. So that's what we will do. Uh, the only thing I will not uh, revisit in detail is, is this Gauss equation. So at some point, we will use that. We'll actually use that, I think, when uh, you have a, a two surface in a, in a three manifold. So later on, this identity, this Gauss equation, will be used with n equals three. So, uh, so this will be a remind manifold. So it will really be one of the slices here, the T3 slice. And we will look at, uh, at the torus at the T2 in T3. Okay. And so what this identity is telling you, it's just telling you the same thing as this uh, Hamiltonian constraint here, uh, but by taking into account some uh, ambient uh, curvature, uh, or kind of matter term, etc. So this is just a, a variant of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian constraint equation that we have already seen. Um, Maybe the sign is different because here we were talking about the Lorentzian signature and here we are talking about uh, everything is Riemannian in this statement. Okay, um, okay so this identity will, uh, will come uh, later. Now, uh, now a few, few more notations. So we will use Sobolev spaces on, on manifold. So if you have uh, your tangent space uh, and you have a local a frame, moving frame, which for instance could be <coughs> obtained by uh, with coordinates, so E j is d over d x j. So with these notations, uh, you can define the regularity of a vector field. I mean, these are just basic uh, basic definitions, right? Uh, so the Lubbock spaces uh, are uh, just defined in a usual way. I mean, you have a metric. Uh, uh, behind this, uh, you have the Sobolev spaces uh, and the tensor fields are, are denoted by that. So I'm, I'm actually I'm not sure I will really uh, use all of these notations, but uh, let me also emphasize that the local conversion, so in these spaces you can, you can talk about regularity or integrability, right, on, on a manifold. Uh, you can also talk about uh, uh, conversions, but, but sometimes, depending on uh, what quantity you talk about, uh, there may not be a canonical norm in these spaces. Right? So for, for s some of these situations, you may say that something converged to, to some limit, uh, but without necessary, I mean, to state that, you have to choose coordinates. right? So in, you choose coordinates, and you can express some convergence of some property, but it doesn't mean that you have a way to, to express a statement uh, independently of the coordinates and compute the norm of, uh, of this quantity. So it may not be the case. OK, uh, so, so you understand that we will work at a low level, weak regularity level. right? So, uh, so we need to talk about distributions. Uh, so, so this is a, a definition that we will use. Uh, the dual space, uh, OK, maybe I, I really would like, I would like to finish with uh, background stuff, maybe just a, two or three pages, and, and then we will make the break. OK, scalar distribution. So they are defined uh, as a dual space, so a, 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 an element f in d prime of your manifold uh, is, uh, by definition, this is a dual space uh, of uh, all compactly supported C infinity m form fields. Right? So you have a continuity property, which is a continuity property that you express for um, for distributions in a, in a usual, usual way. So the only thing to, to understand, and I think it's clear from the example here. So look at this example. If you give me a function f uh, in L1, uh, I can define uh, a distribution. I can view it as a distribution 
on this manifold uh, in, uh, in the following way. So I can, I can define f omega in a duality d prime d simply by this formula, right? So omega is an m form. That's my test uh, function, I mean my test quantity, right? Taken to be an m form. So an m form can be integrated on a, on a manifold, right? That's what you are saying here. And now if you, if you add an f, this is a distribution associated uh, with, this, uh, with this f, okay? So, so this is just, uh, if you like, the generalization, I mean the object which is natural uh, corresponding to this definition. Now, the lead derivative, uh, you know that the lead derivative on functions is just uh, like this, x of f, the lead derivative of vector fields is, uh, is this uh, Lie bracket. Uh, and I guess that's something I may have written already before, so we will uh, use that uh, to compute the lead derivative uh, of uh, tensors, so two covariant tensor field. So I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing anything formal, you know, I just write the definition that we will need to use, right? So if you want to compute the lead derivative of H, so H could be the metric, for instance, right? So for us, H could be actually the metric, and this X will be uh, a killing field in a, in a manifold. So we'll need to compute that, Lie X of, of H, TZ, okay? So take this as a definition, and in a, in a minute we will uh, return to that uh, at a weak regularity level. So here what I, I did, I mean, if you don't know that, it's just uh, that I just uh, use, uh, you know, I just put the LX uh, on, on, the, on the whole quantity, and then I've subtracted by putting LX uh, inside uh, or for the first argument or inside for the second argument. So these are straightforward identities. And uh, similarly, if you want to compute the lead derivative of a form, uh, you have an identity which is like this. Okay. So take that as, as definitions if you, if you are not used by uh, computing with these things. You, you can, I mean, you can, for instance, express this in coordinates, right? Everything coordinates, coordinates of ve vector field, the form, etc. And you, s you see what they mean. I mean, they just mean simple, very simple things that, that we will see later on also. Okay, uh, so now this is useful for uh, defining now the distribution, uh, the derivative. So now what I would like to do, I take a scalar distribution. Okay, so I have a scalar distribution, capital F, and I would like to define uh, the derivative x of this scalar distribution f. Okay, so I want to define this object xf, uh, where f could be applied to an m form, right? So xf also will be applied to an m form. And how do I define this? I just do as you do in distribution theory. I just move the derivative from one side uh, where I, I, I have not yet defined this quantity, so I move it on the other side. And I, uh, now I know, because this is everything here will be smooth, uh, and now I know the meaning of f applied to Lx of omega. So Lx of omega is again an m form, right? So if you think of the example uh, that I, I, I gave you with an f, a small f in L1, just apply this with a small f in L1, and, and you see what, uh, what it means to differentiate in the sense of distributions a function in L1 on a manifold. That's, that's just what we are saying here. Now, uh, okay, so why putting the lead derivative of uh, x of omega here? Simply because that comes from the Carton identity. Okay, so there is an identity here uh, which is satisfied for general forms and, and general functions and general vector fields. Uh, and from this identity, you simply use a Stoke formula. If everything is smooth, you start with x small f I had in mind here the small f of, uh, in L1 from the previous example. So if you, if you indeed compute this uh, with the example of a function in L1, uh, this quantity stands for xf omega, and the other side is minus small f Lx of omega. And this is something, if everything is smooth, uh, this is something that you deduce from Carton identity. Or you, you can even express it in, in coordinates and this is what, what we are saying in coordinates, right? So everything, I mean, don't be afraid by uh, the geometric uh, identity. In the end, if you write what it means, uh, for instance, in the, in the case of this distributional derivative, it actually means something very simple.
Okay, and uh, so I think I'm almost done with that. There is also the space of distribution densities. So it's something completely dual to what I, I discussed. And let me just uh, put it like this. So D prime lambda M of capital M is a dual of now the compactly supported functions on your manifold. Uh, and you can make, give a meaning to omega applied to now a function with compact support. And of course, a canonical choice, a canonical uh, embedding of uh, L1 log in D prime lambda M is given by, uh, is given by this formula here. Right? So now you just switch the role of F and omega. The formula is same as before, but, but now the, uh, the role of F and omega is, uh, is switched. Okay, tensor distributions is the same, uh, the same story. Uh, and uh, again, I wrote uh, more explicitly the example of uh, L1 tensor fields. Okay, so uh, let's make a break. And after the break, uh, so say at uh, 3.30, we will uh, uh, start a uh, genuine definition. Thank you. So in, in this section, I, I will define the the notion of weakly regular manifolds. So before we can even talk about the Einstein equations, we need to define the class of spacetimes of interest. So to do that, we begin with the notion of lead derivative in a weak sense. So this is not difficult. If you uh, remember the formula that I gave a few minutes ago, so Lx of h, say h could be a, a two tensor, a metric, for instance. Uh, so this is a, a two tensor, so you can apply it to two vectors. And this is an identity that we had before that you can take for uh, the definition of the, of the lead derivative in a weak sense. And, uh, and, and this is the assumption that uh, <coughs> now we are going to make. So if we assume uh, that the two tensor H is only L1, locally L1, so it has no, no regularity, just locally L1, uh, and you uh, want to define Lx of h where x is smooth, then you can use this identity where x and z are chosen to be smooth. And if you read this formula, you realize that the first part here can be defined uh, in, in the sense of distributions, exactly like I explained in a, a slide uh, before. Uh, x is a smooth vector field and h of x, y, z has a regularity of h. So it is in L1. So this is a derivative of a quantity in L1. And then to make the formula correct, you have to subtract uh, the lead derivative L, x, y, L, x, z in this way. But of course, uh, x, y, z being smooth, all the arguments are, are smooth, are C infinity or C1 at least, uh, if that's the regularity that you assume here. Uh, and h is in L1, right? So in this formula for the lead derivative of h, you have one term which is a derivative of a quantity in L1, and you have two terms that are L1 uh, uh, functions in L1. Yeah. So that definitely makes sense, and we are going to use that uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, as I said, we will assume T2 symmetry. So the T2 symmetry on a smooth, connected, orientable three manifold. So in practice, uh, sigma is going to be uh, T3, like uh, I had put on the blackboard. So we will have a space-like slice, which would be T3, and some foliation that we will construct. Um, and, uh, and so the symmetry is expressed for a metric, which we assume to be so we have a metric which we assume to be L1 lock uh, on this uh, slice, which I, I'm calling sigma. Uh, so on, on that, so we, we, we put the symmetry assumption by saying that there is a torus group action, T2 group action, by uh, two smooth linearly independent commuting vector fields, which I call X and Y, with closed orbits, defining an action with no fixed point. So so you, you, you will see what these conditions implied in a, in a minute. But the important, the important property is, is that the metric in this direction, x and y, are invariant. So you are expressing now these properties that Lx of h, using this definition, 
is equal to zero and Ly of h is equal to zero. Okay? And this is a statement in a weak sense. This statement involves derivative uh, of, uh, of L1 quantities. So that's part of our definition and essentially this is part, the part that I'm repeating here. The regularity of the metric we will take will actually be H in L infinity. So that is our uh, basic assumption. We have a slice, sigma, a three manifold, sigma. The topology is T3. Uh, and on, on it, we assume that there is a Riemannian metric in L infinity. Okay. So that's, we really start at a very low level with L infinity metrics. We impose a symmetry which we understand uh, makes sense. So we have two killing fields that give us some uh, invariance of the metric. So that makes sense. And now we will add as little uh, regularity assumptions as possible in order to be able to define the Einstein curvature that will be done later. So, uh, so there will be a couple of regularity properties. So the first one will be that we assume H1 or Lipschitz <coughs> regularity uh, for the metric on the T2 symmetric orbits. So by that, I mean that if you, if you look at uh, the metric in the directions X and Y, so you compute H, X, X, H, uh, X, Y, and H, Y, Y, so this is, if you like, the restriction of the metric in a, on, on this torus. Uh, I'm going to assume that this is H1, right? But this is not much, very much, right? It's just one derivative uh, should be square integrable on sigma. Uh, the next uh, property, so I, I, guess, I, I guess this is a misprint, right? Lipschitz regularity, I really mean the next uh, statement here. So the Lipschitz regularity, uh, of the area of the T2 orbits. So you will see later on that the area, and, and some of, of you may know that the area for uh, this uh, space time is, is a very important quantity. It has nice properties of being monotone in uh, time-like directions. Uh, so that's an important quantity. And, and for some reason related to the structure also of the Einstein equations, uh, we, we should, we can, and we should uh, assume some uh, additional regularity, uh, which is this one, or additional integrability. So what I'm, I'm doing now is that I, I look at this quantity xx, yy, and xy to the square. This is the determinant of, uh, of the induced metric on the, on the T2 slices. And uh, so I, I call this r bar square because this is really the area to the square of these uh, orbits of symmetry. And I'm going to assume that this quantity uh, is in W1 infinity, so it's, it's, uh, Lipschitz, it's Lipschitz continuous, sorry. Uh, which is slightly, so, so this is slightly more regular than what you had here, because, because here uh, if, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if you take, so this is basically L2, and here I'm asking for something which is L infinity in terms of derivative, right? Derivative are L infinity rather than being L2, but this is only for a certain combination. Only this combination is assumed to, to be like that. And we have one more uh, condition, which is uh, what I have called here W11 regularity on the orthogonal of the orbits. So, of course, there are many components uh, of the matrix that I didn't talk about, right? Because I only look at x, 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 y, y, y. Uh, so, so, essentially, if you, if you think of the metric in a, in a frame, so the frame that we will use uh, contains x and, and y, and we uh, are going to uh, supplement this frame. We will use some coordinates, so the coordinates will be called x, y, and theta, and they induced a frame of uh, vector fields on, uh, on, on this manifold, which I call x, y, and theta. And, and these vectors commute because they, come, they will come from coordinates. So that's what I'm doing here. I consider a frame uh, of commuting vector fields, say, that will come from the choice of coordinates uh, on the manifold T3. Uh, so I call them x, y, and theta. And what I could do, but I will not do, uh, is to express, I could express the metric in these coordinates, right? So I would be talk looking at uh, 
x, 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 y, uh, h, x, y, h, y, y. And then here I, put, I would put theta, right? And etc. So I could, I could do that. Uh, I could do that, but, but that's not what I want to do. Uh, because this would not uh, allow me to define curvature, etc. So the right idea is actually to take something I, I will call an adapted, fra adapted frame. Okay, this frame will be coordinate, coordinate-based frame. Uh, and, but now the adapted frame, by definition, is such that. Uh, you have this condition that the z is simply orthogonal to x and y. Okay, so you do that and you define now this z uh, to be in, a, in the orthogonal uh, of, uh, of uh, x and y. Uh, x and y are not, need not be orthogonal, right? The case where they are orthogonal would be a special case, a subclass of, uh, of that, but I'm not assuming this. Uh, but I take the orthogonal of the you know, plane uh, and I take a z and the z is taken to be of this form. So theta plus some uh, correction, right? So z is uniquely defined by these conditions. And now I arrive to the final regularity condition that I will impose. So I will impose, uh, so I could really put it like this, right? So I have assumed, now in this frame, I have assumed that these components here where h1, 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 and I have for the determinant that this should be w1 infinity. And now the last condition I put uh, down the screen is that this term here should be w11. Okay. And, and these terms have no regularity. Actually, they are an infinity, but no, you have no information about their derivatives. Okay. So that's a class. I mean, this is really a, a summary of, uh, of what we are uh, going to do. So this is a basic weak regularity that we want to work with and we'll be able to define curvature and to solve the Cauchy problem uh, at this uh, very low regularity level. It's of course completely unclear at this stage uh, if these re weak regularity conditions are sufficient uh, to, to do that, to, to, to define the equations and, and to solve the, the Einstein equations. But, but that's what we will see. Okay, so there is this idea of uh, having an adapted frame, which is very important. And there is a structure of uh, L2, L infinity, L1 uh, integrability that, uh, that will come in the picture several times. And, uh, and, and you will see that there is something, uh, uh, something deep uh, behind, uh, behind this. Our definition is fully geometric. It doesn't depend on the choice of coordinates. If you would change the generators uh, of, uh, of the symmetry, the killing fields, uh, it would not change regularities that I stated. It's completely geometric. Um, since the matrix that we have is Riemannian, um, and, um, and the area uh, R bar is, um, uh, is at least continuous with our regularity assumption, uh, you see that uh, R bar should, uh, the minimum on the, on the slice of R bar is strictly positive, but it, could, it can vanish and it does vanish or, or blow up to infinity uh, uh, in time when you, 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 you look at the whole foliation. But at this level, it's, it's just a bounded quantity and bounded below especially. From the T2 symmetry and the regularities that the ZZ component is in W11 uh, of sigma, we can actually, so this is something we will see in more details uh, later on, we can show uh, that uh, HZZ is continuous and therefore it has to also to have a lower bound which is strictly positive. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a nice uh, metric in, a, in that sense. Uh, and therefore you can look at the inverse. Uh, and the, for the inverse, you get the same regularity in H1 as far as uh, restriction to the T2 slices is concerned. Okay. So this metric, you, if you inverse uh, this part, you get the same H1 regularity because it's non-degenerate. That's what I just said. Uh, I emphasize again that there is no regularity on the derivatives of Hx theta and Hy theta, which are only an infinity. 
And uh, maybe a final remark is, is that what we used to do to raise the indices to go from vectors to covectors uh, can be just done in the same way as before. Uh, at, least, at least you can write this formula, but you have to be careful about the regularity. Uh, the coefficients are L infinity in, in, in general, I mean, uh, because the metric is in L, in L infinity, and it's only some component that will be more regular, right, a according to our definition. But at least it's well defined. It may somehow change the regularity or the integrability of the quantities, but, but it can be computed. The polarized spaces is this special class. Uh, when you assume that the two are orthogonal, x and y are orthogonal, uh, you basically you get only one degree of freedom instead of two for, for this part. And, uh, and you have a special class which is also uh, quite interesting and, and not that easy to, uh, to an analyze. Uh, so if it's, if it's smooth, right, if you start with a guy which is smooth on this side, of course, uh, of course because you multiply by the metric, you are going to change regularity, right? So that's what uh, I, I said. Uh, okay, so we have only one part, right, of the story. So we have only defined, look at the metric on the slice. So let uh, now continue. So to have an initial data set, we need to have a metric plus uh, a second fundamental form, right? Or something that will play the role of the second fundamental form. So I'm now going to introduce a definition of uh, what I call a weakly regular T2 symmetric Riemannian manifold. Uh, and this will be stated in an adapted frame, li like I explained on the, on the blackboard here. And now rather than the metric, we are now discussing the second fun fundamental form K, right? So we have a similar decomposition with components, and, and that's what we do. So we'll assume that all the components are in L2, so K, U, capital V belongs to L2, except the component Z, Z, which is in L1, right? So in, 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 in this, so all these are in L2, and only the last component can have a a lower uh, integrability. Uh, the trace on the orbit of symmetry. So if you compute kxx, kyy, kxy, kyy, and you weight this in a certain way, like, uh, like this, uh, this quantity uh, will be assumed to be bounded. Right? So that's an additional, uh, I'm now computing the trace here weighted in a suitable way, I mean, just according to the definition of the trace uh, on the T2 uh, slices. And I assume that this quantity is bounded rather than being L2. Uh, the T2 symmetry uh, is as before, that K should be invariant under the action of the T2 group generated by X and Y. And what this means is that Lx of K and Ly of K is equal to zero. So now we have our definition to begin. The initial data set is defined with a metric in, uh, in this class in an adapted frame and a second fundamental form uh, in, in this class. Right? So this is roughly L2 and this is roughly, the metric is roughly H1. So that's the level of regularity that, uh, that we are working on. So it's really well below what can be covered by, by you know, more uh, elementary techniques. Um, for the Einstein equations, the sub-norm, so I'm trying here to argue why I'm doing this, but in fact, to really understand it, you have to go to the end of the story and to see how the curvature is defined, how it is solved, we solve the Cauchy problem, etc. So, so at this level, I can just give some uh, motivation, but without really explaining what's going on in details. So for the Einstein equations, uh, the sub-norm bound that I'm putting here, right, trace two of k is L infinity, will in fact be a bound on the time derivative of the area. Okay. Of course, the area is not something that we have yet because this is just a slice of the space-time, right? Uh, the initial uh, data set. So R does not really exist yet, but it will be uh, the area defined within the space-time. And so the second, uh, the trace 2 of K will be essentially the time derivative of R. 
And, uh, and therefore, if, uh, if I assume that the trace 2 of k is bounded, right, which, which is what I assume here, uh, this is quite natural in view of, uh, of this condition that r bar belongs to w1 infinity. So uh, at least what I'm trying to argue with this uh, remark is, is that the two definitions, um, the two definitions here are, are somehow you know, consistent, right? So, so here I'm saying that the area should be Lipschitz and here the trace should be L infinity, but from one to another you have a derivative. There is one derivative. Of course, it's a time derivative, so this is not really something you can see uh, at, th at this uh, level, but, but it, it means that uh, it's rather consistent. Now, uh, we now continue and we look at the space-time itself. Right? So, of course, each slice will have the regularities that I described. Now we look at the space-time, weekly regular space-time. That's what we want to define. We start, like for the metric here, we start at a rather low level and we say an L infinity Lorentzian structure is what? It's a 3 plus 1 manifold with this topology, an interval times T3, together with a Lorentzian metric, and the Lorentzian metric is only assumed to be L infinity locally. Uh, the volume form is also assumed to be bounded below. Right? So you look at the determinant, it's some coordinates, and this quantity has to be bounded below. Right, so not degenerate. We assume the T2 symmetry uh, as, as well. So you think of a picture, a picture like that. We have a decomposition of the manifold and interval cross T3. And each of these slices will have the regularities that I discussed. Uh, but I need now to tell you something about the time variation. Right? What is a regularity in time? And that will what will come now. Um, so we, s we say, so maybe this just specify a little bit more uh, the decomposition on the, on the blackboard. So we'll say that the space-time admits a 3 plus 1 adapted decomposition. If we can have, we have coordinates, t, x, y, theta, right? So obviously uh, x, uh, x, y, theta are coordinates describing each of the t3 slices. And, and t is a time function, so every slice will correspond to t equal constant. Right? So that's the setup that we uh, study here. Uh, and so these coordinates are chosen to be adapted to the product decomposition. Uh, t is on some interval. x, y, z are periodic on t3. And we choose the coordinates uh, so that they agree with the killing fields x and y that we, that we had on, on this uh, manifold with T2 symmetry. And we express this uh, metric decomposition in, in this form. So, so, so here there is implicitly the, the condition, the assumption that uh, some lapse quantity is, is zero. But ju just read it as, it as it is written here. So, so if, you, if you want the metric, the space-time metric, you have one part that is a multiple of dt squared. Which is a, a coefficient here that depends, of course, on all the variables t, x, y, z. But you can look at the trace uh, on, a, on a slice t equal constant to to, uh, to to describe it. So this is a general function of all variables. But but I, I just want to emphasize the dependence in terms of t. So we have minus n square dt square because it's a Lorentzian signature. And then we have a metric which is the induced metric on these slices. So it's, uh, it's Riemannian. Uh, and, and we have uh, these assumptions. So what I'm writing here is just consistent with the regularity here. Maybe I, you, could, you could add a, possibly a lo local here. But now lo local really uh, refers to, uh, to the fact that in time, the metric can indeed blow, blow up in, in some way. So. Um, so, so this is a decomposition that we will be using to describe the space-time. So the space-time metric can be computed as minus n squared dt squared plus h, where h is the induced metric on the slices. OK. So, so far, these are you know, just notation, the setup for describing uh, space-time with this t2 symmetry and uh, t3 being the topology of the slices. Uh, so as I said, uh, we have, uh, implicitly there is this assumption of a vanishing shift. Uh, 
uh, and the fact that you can use global coordinates, etc. Right? But, but we will construct that, so we will solve the initial value problem and show that such coordinates and a, a product form like this exist uh, for solutions of the Einstein equation, so it's not really a restriction in that sense. And since the manifold is invariant uh, by our group action, we already know that these quantities n and h are invariant by the group action. So if you compute the lead derivative with respect to x and y of n and h, uh, you, you do get zero. And again, let me emphasize that these are statements that only make sense weakly because n is L infinity and h is also only L infinity. So, so this is just a little bit long story to say that we have a metric, Lorentzian signature, and we only assume L infinity as uh, the first uh, regularity condition. Okay, so we are basically at the stage, the same stage we were here uh, when we are discussing the metric in, uh, in, sp in space. Okay, uh, now, we need, uh, okay, we need to fix that. So, so far, I mean, uh, from the rest of the discussion, we will always have this setup, an L infinity Lorentzian structure, meaning that you enjoy the T2 symmetry admits an adapted 3 plus 1 decomposition. We have a frame adapted to the symmetry, and we will play with two frames. One will be, so T is DDT, this capital T. It corresponds to the time coordinate here. And X, Y, theta are the fields that comes from coordinates that we have on, a, on a, our manifold. Uh, and we will play with both. So in the rest of the discussion, you will see that some statements or some calculation will be done with this frame uh, in mind. And uh, maybe basically the regularity is stated in x, y, z, and the calculations are done in x, y, theta, right? And this is somewhat necessary. I mean, you have to really play, uh, play with these two frames, and both are important. We write sigma t to mean uh, a slice t3 cross a constant value of t. So these are the level sets determined by the function, the time function t on this uh, space time. And now I'm, I'm ready to uh, complete the definition of the regularity uh, of our space time metric. So it, it goes like this. Uh, we first look at the lead derivative in the time direction of the metric. And we assume that this lead derivative is in L1. Right? So, so you have seen that the discussion is, is, is always to have to, to control one derivative and to say that this derivative is in L2 or L infinity or L1. So obviously, L1 is weaker, L infinity is stronger. And you have to play with this in, in a way that will become clear uh, when we will define the curvature. Uh, so, so that's the that's structure that is in this problem. So here I start at some at a lower level to assume that this is only in L1. So I have my metric on each slice. And I look at the variation in time. Right? And this derivative in time should be L1 on uh, every slice. So this is really something that you have on a, defined on a slice. So of course, it also depends on t. And in terms of t, I, I will assume that we have uniform bounds. So I wrote, I'm writing here L infinity log in time. So on every slice, you define this quantity uh, here. So every slice, this quantity will be uh, computed. I mean, you, you will see some explicit expressions in a few minutes. Uh, and, and this quantity is assumed to be L1 on every slice. But of course, this is a statement where t is like a parameter, right? You can vary t uh, inside this statement. And what I, I want to assume here is that you can bound this L1 norm uh, uniformly in t, right? But maybe not quite uniformly, because when t goes to some singularity in the past or in the future, of course, it, it may blow up, right? So I'm just saying locally, on the interval, of the, on the compact sub-interval of, uh, of, uh, of a time function, uh, you have uniform bounds. Now, the next uh, statement uh, is, is what we expect. So we are going to say that sigma t, the slice, the induced metric, which we have already defined, 
the second fundamental form, which I am now defining by this. So I look at the time, the variation of the in induced metric in time, lead derivative t of h. Since capital T may not be a unit, I have actually uh, to take into account the norm of capital T, and the norm of capital T is computed by returning to, uh, to the expression or the decomposition of the space-time metric. So, so this is the definition of the second fundamental form. So I put it here, and now what I want to say, I want to say that sigma T, the induced metric, and the second fundamental form defined like this, is a weakly regular T2 symmetric uh, triple. That's something we have defined, right? Um, now, this makes sense because 1 over n of t, n of t, we have assumed that it, it was bounded below, right? So this quantity is really bounded. And this quantity makes sense because I already uh, Im imposed that here, right? I have imposed that here, uh, these quantities in L1. So that's the regularity that I have repeated here. So, so when, you, when you look at this, this uh, quantity here, so you know that sigma t has a metric which is... Uh, um, L infinity, and you have a second fundamental form or, a, or tens, I mean some additional two tensor which is in L1. Right? So you, you take uh, this object and now you impose that it is weakly regular uh, in a sense that we discussed before. Right? So wha what that means is that H is not only just L infinity, but it has this property uh, that we have introduced on on the slices, uh, and in the same way, K is not only L1, but some components are L2, or trace is L infinity, right? So there's something additional to, to it. And, um, and, okay, and there is one more uh, condition, and, and you will see how it comes. So I, I call it conformal regularity. Uh, I, I explain this in a, in a minute. Uh, and it goes like this. You now, you now consider um, the vector z, uh, which is uh, orthogonal to t, x, and y. So now I'm taking the orthogonal, not only x, y, but t, x, y, orthogonal. And I, uh, I look for a z, which is of the form theta, right? We had coordinates. We have this vector field coming from coordinates. x and y are coming from coordinates. Uh, and, and so, of course, I can always find, I mean, it's just a decomposition. I mean, it's just a, in the orthogonal, you can find a unique vector which has this form. And I use this z to express some additional regularity condition. Okay. And so, you look at it. I mean, we will really return to that and you, you will see how it is used. Um, but the conditions are on, on this ratio, h, z, z over n squared. Of course, H, Z, Z is the same as G, Z, Z. So this was the induced metric, the space-time metric. And this quantity is, uh, is um, what's called the lapse function. Uh, and it's given by this uh, norm of the T component. Uh, so so we, have, we have that. And, uh, and so I'm assuming that this quantity rho, may maybe I should say immediately, what is this rho? So let me, OK, show it here. The so conformal quotient metric uh, is going to be this. So if you if you drop the uh, the two killing fields, if you if you look at the quotient metric, uh, and you you look at uh, uh, so you look at the quotient and you, and you look at the metric on this uh, quotient, uh, you, um, you 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 get you get that. I mean this is a conformal metric. So you have extracted a, a factor. Uh, and, and this is a main metric. I mean, you, you see that, right? The row here is a ratio of, uh, of n squares that we had here. So I just pull out the n squared here, and I divided whatever I had here by n squared, and I just somehow forget about uh, the dx uh, squared, dy squared, etc. terms, right? So this is a metric on the quotient metric, and the point I want to make is that this metric is determined by this row, this row squared. So, uh, and so it's going to determine the wave operator that we will uh, see in the Einstein equations, like you have seen before, right? We do expect wave operators uh, to appear on, uh, on our metric uh, terms. Uh, so, so this will come about, and, and it turns out that the right regularity, the right level of regularity is, uh, so now I, I go back 
uh, one slide uh, to finish with this uh, definition. And so, so this rho here, this conformal factor, is going to be, is, is assumed to be W21. So what this means is that if you compute two derivatives, you stay in L1. Uh, and here, there's something similar that if now I compute the time derivative of this guy, I have computed one derivative, so it's quite natural to assume it to be W11. Okay. So all of that is, is not random, right? All these conditions are, are made uh, so that we can both express the Einstein equations in a weak sense and solve the Cauchy problem. Okay. Um, so, when we go for the application to the Einstein equations, uh, of, of course there is a foliation in a, in a picture. So, what we will do, we will construct first a specific foliation where we do get this regularity, and then we will look at other foliations and realize that the same regularity can be preserved on a, with a different time function, a different way to, to do a slicing of, of the space-time. Right? So, so, the foliation is not something so important in terms of regularity, we will preserve the regularity by changing the foliation in a certain class. Uh, another remark is, uh, is that there are some additional regularity uh, properties in time, uh, which of course we have to state in terms of some topologies in space, right? So there's something additional in time, uh, which we'll see later on, uh, and is related to solving the equations. Right? So when you solve some PDE, you usually have some regularity in time that uh, you did not uh, anticipate. Um, okay, now if you look at the coefficient n, so you remember that it was uh, only L infinity at some point, uh, so here I want to emphasize the regularity of, uh, of n, uh, so to do that, let me go back maybe one, uh, one line here, one page. So I'm looking at this, okay, where uh, I, I know that H, I know some regularity of H Z Z. Uh, I didn't impose anything on N squared, but I, I do know that the ratio is in W12, 2, 2, 1. Okay, so just from this, you see that you can deduce some regularity uh, for n, that's what I wrote here. Uh, from the decomposition of z uh, in, a, in this form, on a, uh, you get, uh, you can compute the Lie derivative of z. Uh, so the, the point, actually, the point of this uh, of this uh, line here is just to express the fact that uh, Lt of z only contain, you know, it's a vector field that could, in principle, contain components on x, y, z, and t, right? But it turns out, if you look at the structure, it only contains components uh, along x and y, and uh, if you look at the regularity, these components here are L1. Okay, okay, that will just come in uh, some of the calculations later on. And, and now to, to try to make things a little bit more uh, concrete, so, so you remember that here I put the regularity for the matrix, the induced matrix, the second fundamental form, now, what uh, we will need uh, to play with the equations, we will need to have expressions of the second fundamental form in terms of the metric, and that's what I have stated here. Okay. So, um, so, so it just follow from the definition uh, that the component K, A, B, so K, A, B, uh, A, B will vary, will correspond to the vector X and Y. So my notation here is, is that A stands for uh, either, so this A belongs to capital X, capital Y, right? So if I, if I write something like K, A, B, it means uh, any of, uh, of K, X, X, or K, X, Y, or K, Y, Y. And Okay, and, and here I'm giving you the expressions, right, in terms, and, and there's nothing difficult, it just comes from the definition that I gave for the second fundamental form. So it's roughly like a time derivative of the metric, and this is what you get. So KAB is uh, correspond to this part here of the, of the metric, right? 
so maybe I'm not going to write them on the, on the blackboard, but, but at least what you can see, you can compare the regularity that we had assumed here. So we say that everything was L2, and in this corner we had L1, and the trace was L infinity, right? So, uh, so from, from these expressions, you, you, can, you can see that, right? So KAB is in L2, KAZ is given by some other formula is in L2 as well, and KZZ is a time derivative of the HZZ component of the metric. But this is only in L1. Right? So I, I, will need to, I will need to tell you how at, uh, at this level of regularity, we, for instance, we can define the, um, we can define the Einstein constraints and, and the Einstein evolution equations, etc. So that will be the, the goal uh, now. Uh, so before we, we do that, uh, there is maybe one more definition here. Uh, if we are given a weakly regular T2 symmetric Lorentzian manifold with an adapted frame li like I, I described, uh, we can introduce the following uh, notion. Uh, we look at the orbits of symmetry, so T2 orbits. And we compute, we look at the metric HAB, so this part, this part here of the metric, and we uh, compute uh, this quantity, Z of HAB. Right? We normalize uh, by the, the norm of uh, this norm of Z. Uh, and, and this is a quantity that I'm now going to call kappa AB, and it, uh, it represents uh, the way that the slices are curved, I mean, this is the second fundamental form of the T2 orbits in T3, right? The T2 orbits in T3 are described, their geometry, expansive geometry is described by this quantity, and this quantity is in, uh, is in L2, right? That's what we, uh, we see from our assumptions. Uh, and, uh, and now I have a lemma which is elementary, where now I'm going to compute the trace of this guy, right? So you compute the trace, so you compute H A B chi A B. Chi A B, you replace it by this. One over square root of H Z Z, this is something that I have kept. And now you have to compute the product H A B Z of H A B, uh, knowing that one is the inverse of the other, and knowing that R is uh, the determinant of, uh, of this two by two matrix. Right. So that's just a, an easy uh, calculation that uh, you may know. Uh, and I have, uh, so that's nothing but the mean curvature of the symmetry orbits. And we have another formula here, where instead of looking now at, uh, at the curvature of T2 in T3, we are now looking at the the curvature of uh, a second fundamental form of T3 in, uh, in a space-time, right? which is described by capital K. And we look at the trace. So the trace is a mean curvature of that. So in the same way, you compute Hij, Kij, you return to the definition we had for Kij, and you realize that something very similar to, to that is true, where H is now the determinant of the whole metric. Right? And this was the determinant of a uh, two by two uh, extracted metric. And now, in terms of regularity, I should uh, emphasize that. Uh, so this regularity, the mean curvature is L infinity. Uh, so this is this, uh, this uh, statement that, uh, that we had here. And, uh, and the fact that K is in, uh, is in L1 is uh, now the, some of the lowest uh, integrabilities that we, we are allowing in, uh, in our definitions. OK. So so here we are now uh, in this weak regularity class. How do we define the Einstein's constraints? How we define the Einstein's evolution equations? And how do we prove the existence for the initial value problem? So this is going to take a little bit more of, of time, but uh, let's proceed. Uh, so weak version of the Einstein's constraints. Uh, the objective here is to, uh, so to, to define this, right? So to define this, we, we need the Christopher symbols, we need the curvature. But even at the level of the Christopher symbols, it's already unclear. Because, because if you look at the definitions, they involve ill-defined products. Uh, even if you allow yourself to look at uh, distributions, 
Right? So it's quite severe. If you, you look at the formula, and you will see that in the formula there will be product typically of uh, maybe two L1 functions. Uh, you know. uh, so you have to be careful uh, what, uh, what you do. And, and one idea is, uh, is uh, again, to use this adapted frame. And I guess I, I did not emphasize uh, enough that uh, this frame x, y, z, z is in orthogonal of x and y, uh, but this property involves a metric, but the metric is not regular. Right? So z is not regular. Okay. So this frame is, is quite nice, it's adapted to our symmetry, but it's not regular. Right? And the other frame x, y, theta, it's, it's very smooth, but it's not a frame in which we could state our regularity assumptions. Okay, of course we could do it, but it would just be messy and it would be complicated. The natural statement is in this uh, adapted frame. Um, so, uh, yeah, so more specifically, if you look at gamma, theta, theta, this is uh, with three theta, it's ill defined and it involves products uh, like this h, i, theta and the derivative of h theta b, b is any x and y, uh, but h is only L infinity, right? So, so it's really not, uh, no good. Uh, so, so we'll work in this adapted frame. Uh, and I have one more remark uh, here, is that since z is not smooth, it's L infinity, it's, it cannot be applied, so you remember that I explained how you apply the vector field to uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any distribution, but the vector field had to be smooth, right? But this Z is not smooth, so uh, but it's not going to apply to an L1 function uh, in general. But it does apply to T2 symmetric functions, that's what we will be working with, uh, provided we, we, we uh, set the following definition. So if you want to compute z of f, uh, just compute theta of f. Right? Because the, the remaining terms, I mean, they are in a way ill-defined uh, terms that are, I mean, irrelevant uh, for, uh, for, for that purpose. Right? So, so z can be applied to any function which is in L1, provided it, it has this T2 symmetry, it enjoys this T2 symmetry, uh, and, and that's the definition that we make. Okay. Uh, so, I, the way I proceed is that I assume that the metric is smooth, right? I, I do a calculation that takes a, a page or two, and after that I propose a definition, okay, of, of every, every equation. I mean, there will be quite a few equations to be considered, but, but the philosophy is, uh, is like that. So, assume regular data and see what you can do, and, and then get the idea of how you should define uh, the curvature say, quantities. Okay, so uh, I recall that x, y, theta commute, uh, that we have this orthogonality condition and the T2 symmetry, uh, and I simply compute the Christoffel symbols, right, in this case. So let's see what, how they look like. Uh, this is essentially the definition, and I, I, I realize that some of these partial derivatives uh, are vanishing, etc. And I express everything in terms of a, of a z derivative of some metric components, right? And this is, again, this is the inverse of, uh, of this guy here. So, uh, so I, I do that systematically for every term. So some of them would just be zero. For instance, gamma a z z is identically vanishing. Uh, and here you have gamma a z b, which is given by some uh, formula like, uh, like that. So you see, you know, so you see that the two terms are the same. I just replace capital X by capital Y. Uh, so they, they look more or less uh, the same, but different uh, positions for, for the indices. And I have two more here, gamma Z, Z, A, which is identically zero, and gamma with three Z, uh, which can be expressed as, uh, as a log. I guess I, I sorry, I forgot. Uh, okay, this cannot be right. Uh, okay, so for, forget this line. I mean, there is a z missing and maybe even, uh, maybe one half is correct. I think there's just a z missing here. But in any case, so they, they look the same, right? H with some indices and you have a z derivative of, uh, of uh, some components of the metric. Some are zero and some are that, okay? Uh, now, so if the metric is regular, 
These are just uh, the formulas that you, that you find. So now I, I proceed like this. I, I decide uh, that my weak version of the Christopher symbols uh, is, is this. Right? So I just say I will define gamma to be 0, this gamma to be 0, I will define gamma a, z, b to be that, gamma a, b, z to be this quantity, this will be 0, and this uh, with three z factors uh, is defined to be, to be that. Okay? Uh, so I, I want to emphasize that if, so of course maybe this seems pretty obvious, but, but if, you, if, you, uh, if you don't decide that, if you don't postulate this as a definition, and you use a, a usual definition somehow, uh, this definition doesn't make sense because it involves terms that may not be, are not well defined, some of them. I mean, maybe not many even for, for the piece of all symbols. But of course it becomes worse when you look at the curvature. But some of them are, are meaningless. So you cannot, strictly speaking, uh, compute them from the original definition. Okay. But since for smooth metric, this, these uh, are equivalent, the formula, the general formula are equivalent to that, I'm going to use this, these definitions. Okay? And I call this my weak version of the Christopher symbols. And they do make sense. Right? So that's maybe the first remark. You look at the quantity and you realize that with the regularity assumptions that I made, uh, these quantities have a meaning. And more precisely, they have this regularity. So they are in L2, uh, except that the ZZZ component which is in L1, so that's what you have, right? They involve one derivative of the metric. So we are, we are this uh, level here. You, you are taking uh, one derivative of the metric. So I think this statement is pretty clear from, uh, from the metric on, uh, on, the, on the blackboard, uh, that the coefficients are all in L2, uh, except the, the one in the corner, right? Uh, which is only in L1, and in addition, Y you would expect something more, right? Because, uh, because here we have assumed some additional uh, Lipschitz property, right? W1 infinity for the area of the T2 orbits. So you expect this to translate into an interesting property for, uh, for the Christopher symbols. And that's indeed the case that if you look at this trace, gamma AAZ, so A goes from X, capital X, capital Y, this quantity is bounded. Um, and, of course, what is uh, important is, is that the, what I define as my weak version of the Christopher symbols uh, coincides with, uh, with the standard Christopher symbols if the, the manifold is regular, is regular enough. Um, okay, and, and this is a calculation of the mean curvature of the T2 orbits. Right, that we, we have seen at some point before, but, but here there is, a, there is a formula, so the regularity that we had assumed was on this, right, R bar, the area uh, was Lipschitz, so it has this property here, and what I did here was just to expand the area is given by the determinant of the metric, so I, I, explain, I expanded what it means, then I took the inverse uh, so I, I'm going from HYY to HXX, so this is really the inverse. The inverse and you divide by the determinant. I, I hope the formula is correct, but... Uh, uh, okay, okay, I, I think it's correct. I mean, sometimes there's, there may be some uh, uh, factor in terms of R bar that may be uh, not completely correct. Um, but in any case, w the point is that you can relate the Z derivative of R bar uh, to these Christopher symbols, right? So you see everything is on the screen, right? Over here, you see that gamma A, B, Z, and what you have to do, you have to compute the trace of this. So you have to assume that you to take B equal to A and sum for A equal X and A equals Y, right? And you get this term here, uh, which is exactly the trace. Okay. So, y so you really see that the trace uh, property for the Christopher symbols comes from the condition uh, that the area of symmetry was Lipschitz. Um, so, um, so the weak version of the Hamiltonian constraint. Um, so now we have all the discussion for the Christopher symbols and we can start 
writing the first uh, Einstein constraint equations. We uh, proceed by assuming that sigma hk is now a weakly regular T2 symmetric triple, so we have added uh, this data, capital K. And we observe that gamma z, z, z is only in L1, and therefore it cannot be multiplied by Christoffel coefficients which are in L2 or in L1. Uh, and so it's clear that in you know, the definition of the curvature there's going to be some, some problems, that some terms are definitely uh, uh, ill-defined. And so we will, uh, we will do a similar, uh, you know, similar, follow similar idea as we have done for the Christopher uh, symbols uh, uh, now. And we are going to, uh, to use the properties that we have, right? So, so the regularity properties that we have is that this guy is in L2, in L1, and, and this trace in L infinity. Okay. So that will come to, uh, to give a meaning to, to that. So the strategy is like this. We'll first define the Ricci component. Right? So remember that this Hamiltonian constraint has something to do with the, with the scalar curvature of the three manifold on the slice here. That's the quantity that we would like to, uh, to handle. But before we can do that, we will look at the Ricci component, RZZ. So for some, some reason, I mean, this is really the term that uh, poses the most difficulty, so we somehow look, always look at it first. So we are going to define the Ricci component <coughs> corresponding to Ricci of ZZ, uh, of this manifold sigma H. Then we will rely on the Gauss equation for the T2 orbits in order to define the scalar curvature of the manifold. Right? So we have the Ricci component, the curvature of the T2 orbits is vanishing, so, so we are going to uh, be able to compute the scalar curvature out of that. I, I will give you the formula in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and, and then we will also, because in the statement of the first Einstein constraint, we have also the second fundamental form, or, or capital K, uh, so we will also need some decomposition of capital K. So remember that the regularity was, you know, somehow different, each component has a different uh, integrability, so, so we have to be careful with, with, with this before we can write the Einstein constraint. But finally we will uh, we'll be able to do that and we will express the Hamiltonian constraint in a weak form. Okay, so I, I proceed like I said, I look at the ZZ component of the Ricci curvature of, of a three manifold. By definition, we have a contribution involving one derivative of the Christoffel symbols, and we have a contribution involving uh, products of Christoffel symbols. So I look first at this uh, omega-1 quantity, and I, I look at what it is, right? So I goes from x, y, and z. There are three, uh, three possibilities for this index. And a is only x, uh, x, uh, y, uh, and therefore you see that this quantity is, 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 is that, right? This term produces these two terms. And then you do similarly. This guy will give you uh, the, the quantity for when i is equal to z, and then you have a quantity when i is equal to a. But some of these terms are vanishing, so in the end you realize that this omega 1 is uh, minus the derivative of what you find is actually this trace gamma a a z that we found, you know, had some special property, some special uh, uh, bound. And you, you do something similar for the quadratic terms here. So omega 2, you use the fact that some of these uh, Christopher symbols are vanishing that uh, I mentioned before. And you express what it is, what it is, so it's a bit long, but in, in the end it simplifies quite a bit. And, okay, and now, so I have to emphasize the step that goes from this line to this line. Okay. So what I, I did here, I, I actually encountered terms uh, here that involve uh, z, 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 you know, three z uh, indices multiplied by, uh, I guess we should probably stop, uh, stop very soon. Uh, you know, so, so I, I will make this point and, and, and stop with, with that. So, uh, so here we have three z that, uh, that comes, and so in the formula, we see that. So if, if I really want to compute that, 
uh, for weekly regular metrics, I, I cannot do, do it because I would, uh, I, would, I would get terms that are defined in the sum of distribution, so this is fine. But at some point, I will write this line, and if I write this line, I'm, I'm dead because, because this is a product of two quantities that are only in L1. Okay. And so the observation is that if you do the calculation uh, for uh, regular metrics first, okay, you, you do this calculation, which of course makes sense, you, uh, you can observe that such terms do arise, but uh, you always have two of them. So they always cancel each other. This one cancel with another one, maybe upstairs, or etc., over here. Right. So you, you cancel out ill-defined, possibly ill-defined terms, and you end up with, uh, with a definition that you want. Right? So, uh, so here I've just collected what we have observed. This quantity Z of gamma AAZ is written here. And I have obtained for the quadratic terms uh, this part here. And now let's look at our conclusion. So what we conclude is that uh, the Ricci ZZ3 uh, is well defined as a distribution. It contains one term, which is a derivative of a bounded function. So I use this notation w minus 1 infinity to, uh, to mean that this is a derivative, distributional derivative of L, L infinity function. And then you have two, two types of terms. So there is, of course, a summation here. But, but this, is, this is a summation of a, a trace that we have seen before, which is bounded. This gamma z, z, z is the one for which we had the lowest integrability, but fortunately it's multiplied by the one for which we had the better information. And, and then you have two terms here uh, with a summation of A and B, and all these products are L2, L2. So this is L1, this is W minus 1 infinity, and it's, it's well defined in a weak sense. And of course you have this property uh, that if you assume sufficient regularity, this new definition, if you like, coincide with the old definition. Right, so it's completely consistent. But that definition makes sense for weekly regular metrics. The, the classical definition does, does not. So we stop with this, and, and uh, I will continue next, uh, next Friday. And uh, I will put this on my blog uh, maybe today or tomorrow, certainly.